Hey folks, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now, August has already shot by, it's the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for me to do another one of my bike news reviews. So it's time to take a look at the uh, motorcycle news here in the UK over the last month, at least as seen by MCN. So if you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles, stick around and stay tuned. So the eagle-eyed amongst you will see that I've only got three copies of MCN here, and it being a Wednesday, and it's currently a quarter past ten, I should have four. Normally MCN props through the old letterbox on a Wednesday, but my uh, unfortunately my postman's not very consistent. So uh, what I'll do is I'll get cracking with the review. We'll go through these first three papers. I've got loads of stories to go through here, and hopefully uh, today's MCN will be posted in the meantime. It takes me usually all day, believe it or not, to actually uh, film, edit, publish these uh, these videos. So hopefully. By the time I've been through these three, the next one will be along, but let's see. Anyway, enough waffle, let's crack on with the news. Okay, so the first uh, issue of the paper here, I've actually uh, picked out six stories here I just wanted to mention in passing. I thought it was interesting though that their headline on the front paper here, Summer Sizzler, why 2018 is your best biking summer yet. Um, interesting because as soon as they said Summer Sizzler, the summer seemed to disappear. The summer here in the UK has been absolutely cracking. We seem to get no spring, it went straight from winter, straight into a really hot summer, and now it's suddenly gone all, all tumble on us again. So uh, I'm sort of blaming MCN a bit for mentioning Summer Sizzler for doing that. Anyway, right, first story I've picked out here, is this one, Ducati plans new V4 range. And I guess this isn't a surprise given the uh, V4 Panigale is now amongst us and has got such great plaudits. Well, Ducati are saying that they're gonna use the V4 for the basis of a number of their high-end only bikes. Um, so for example, um, they're saying that they're not gonna uh, repackage the V4 into the, into the smaller bikes. So for example, the 959 won't be getting a V4. They've got no plans to do that. And they say that's because of the amount of time it takes to assemble the V4 uh, versus the twin motorcycle. It would just, the twin engine rather, it would just make the, um, the bike too expensive to buy. So we ain't gonna see it in the smaller bikes, but uh, the bigger bikes, certainly. Uh, and there's rumor of the Multistrada getting it next, I guess, no surprise there, but it'll be lovely to see that. Uh, and also uh, MCN speculate that there may be a naked V4 Ducati coming along soon. That'd be something really nice to see. Um, so keep your eye out on uh, on bike news. Let's see what Ducati come up with. I mean, it's, it is no surprise, but it's gonna be great to see some new bikes coming from Ducati and seeing what the new styling and so on is, I think, with that on board. I don't think I've read any reviews of the V4 being a bad engine so I think it's a great move. All right, second story here. Uh, just a little one down here on the side. It's an uphill battle is the uh, is the title. I only mention this because this is something called the Cop Hill Climb. If you live in the UK and you're relatively local to the southeast, sort of uh, Aylesbury, Prince's Risborough area, which I am, I'm not far away, I'm about well, maybe 10 miles or something. Every year uh, there's this thing called the Cop Hill Climb. It's of interest because it's mainly a car event to be honest, but there are motorcycles too. And it's run up this old hill uh, near Prince's Risborough called Cop Hill, which used to be, believe it or not, in I think the 1920s, part of the Formula One uh, circuit. There was no Formula One then, but it was part of the official motor racing circuit, driving cars and bikes up that hill. Well, it got reinvented about, I don't know, probably eight, nine years ago now. Uh, and they and they run cars up the hill every September. So it's on from September the 15th to 16th. If you've not been before, it's, it's quite cheap to get in. It's something like a tenner a ticket or something. It's a great day out. I've been a number of years. It's really good. I'll probably go again this year. So if you think they're going on, have a look out for me and uh, maybe I'll see you there. Um, so Cop Hill Climb, stick that in your diaries if you're not doing anything on the 15th and 16th. Just a little plug for them there. I've got a pal who actually does some of the work behind the scenes for that. So uh, partly why I mention it, but it is a good event. Okay, next uh, next item here. Five pound bag could save your bike. And here they're talking about um, a little um, a little bag that's basically radio signal proof um, that you can put your keyless ignition uh, keys in, if that makes sense, or the keyless ignition fob, I should say. And now the, the reason they're saying this is because it turns out that the police have said that actually it's quite easy for new waves of crooks to steal key bikes with keyless ignition. What they do is scan the signal that comes out of the fob uh, and then they can effectively um, retransmit that when you've gone, start your bike and away they go. This is something that uh, car thieves have been doing for years because they, we've had uh, keyless um, ignition of fobs on cars for some years just you know, coming through on bikes now. But uh, that, that is a, a real issue with them. In fact, I spoke to my friends at uh, Principal Insurance um, a while about, back about this, and they were saying that actually the premiums on bikes with keyless condition are slightly higher than those with normal keys um, bec because of this fact. Um, that was more rumor than fact, but they were saying that's what they suspected underwriters were saying. Uh, and it's very interesting. Um, Personally, as if you watched me in my videos before, you may know that I'm not a massive fan of keyless ignition on bikes anyway. I never find using a key is a big problem. But once you do use it and you get used to it, it's quite convenient having the fob in your pocket. But if it does mean that your insurance is gonna cost more, and it does mean that your bike's more easily pinched, maybe you wanna think twice about uh, signing up for that particular option. So there we go, that's uh, just interesting. And also this, I mean, the fact that now a manufacturer is sort of capitalizing on this, making a bag that's uh, 
RFID proof, as it were. Uh, you've then got to carry that bag around with you. Wouldn't I? Just, just give me a set of keys. That's just going to work easier. All right, next one in here then. Uh, number four that I wanted to um, point out. Oh, just in passing, <laughs> blog off, little uh, column that I and four other uh, vlogger types, well, two vloggers, two other people that I'm not sure who they are, uh, do this each month in MCN. I don't know if you've seen it before. Um, this month I talked about um, whether loud pipes really do save lives. And uh, so that's in there, something uh, worth reading. Fagan from 44 Teeth also does it. Uh, it's worth buying MCN just for that, I think. Okay, little plug for MCN then. I don't think they needed it, but anyway, there we go. Uh, check that out if, uh, if you want to. Uh, anyway, next actual news story. Here we are. There's a, in, this is in the letters page. Um, somebody for, called Kevin Stanley from Deeside in North Wales has written in, talking about the Welsh police. They've been coming in for a bit of um, stick of late up in North Wales because uh, they've been accused of um, stopping bikers for no good reason, for silly things. Well, you could say silly things. They are technically legal things like small number plates, smoked helmet visors, that kind of stuff. And then uh, a couple of months ago, there was a big article in MCN saying that that's not the case. They went out with the Welsh police and did a very pro police bit and I'm, to be fair I'm, I'm pro biker police as well so I'm not having a real go at the police here just an interesting talking point um, but this guy Kevin reckons that uh, they've recently been stopped for no other reason than that they had a slightly smaller number plate now I don't know the the um, surrounding circumstances obviously um, he says he, they weren't speedy or anything like that but they got a 400 pound fine for a small number plate so just be a bit careful if you are up in Wales um, it seems a bit petty doesn't it I think I mean I, I admit I run with slightly smaller than properly legal number plates on my bikes mainly because they just look slightly neater. It's nothing to do with trying to you know, hide from speed cameras or anything like that. You can certainly read the number plates. I think my view is if, you, if you've got something that's readable, you should be okay. But uh, technically, of course, it's not okay. So just, you know, just be careful. Same thing with smoke visors. I don't know anyone that's been pulled over for wearing a smoke visor. I, I wear a smoke visor often. Depends how much it is smoked, of course. But if you ride with it at night, then you know, if you're pulled over, that's probably it. You probably deserve it, right at night with a smoke visor, not a good idea. Anyway, so just interesting that the police certainly in Wales seem to be clamping down on that sort of thing. So just to let you know if you weren't aware of that and you're thinking of riding up in Wales. Okay, last um, last point in here, or last article I wanted to point out in this first um, edition of the paper. Uh, Kings of Cool is the um, headline here, and this is one of these big group tests that MCN do. I love these because after the initial... Um, Ferrari around new models are launched, you know, journalists get wined and dined, whisked off to exotic places to uh, look at these new, new bikes and they always say that they're great, great bikes and let's not get into it now but I, I often say bikes are great because I think that uh, there are no really bad bikes out there now, not new ones anyway, but anyway I digress. The point is, when these bikes are initially out, they tend to always get glowing reviews. It's only six months to a year afterwards when these group tests start to come in and there's some comparisons done. We can get a really good feel for what the what the bikes are like against each other. So taking a Triumph Thruxton, the Scrambler 1100 and the uh, Kawasaki Z900 RS here, and they've done their long uh, test ride on it. They do it for something like 250 miles around a standard route that they do all these um, long tests on, which I think is a great idea. And then they and they you know they swap bikes and they compare them and they see what everybody thought. And the outcome of this one with those three bikes is basically well they're all great. Um, in fact, they all get four stars out of five. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it takes to get five out of five. Um, and they're all um, similar priced except for the Kawasaki Z900 RS, which is uh, actually a couple of grand less than the other two. The other two are sort of 12,300 ish. The Kawasaki Z900 RS 10,200. And if pushed, when you read the verdict from Adam Child here, the MCN guy, um, he's saying that actually the Z900 with some different cans on the back, maybe to make it a bit noisier, um, is probably the better all round bike. For me personally, having uh, ridden two of these three bikes, um, I love the Kawasaki. I'm not surprised that the Z900 RS comes out. I've, uh, if I had spare cash at the moment, space in the garage, um, and uh, was gonna get a retro bike, it'd be the Kawasaki Z900. I absolutely love that. So I'm glad to see that uh, MCN kind of agreed with me that that's the best current uh, retro bike of this style. I mean, there are others out there I haven't ridden, but the, the Z900 I absolutely love. So there we go. So that was the, those are the stores I picked out for the first edition. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, camera says I've been talking for nine minutes already. Okay, next then, uh, what have we got in here? Another six articles. It's always a bit of a surprise, because obviously I read these a few weeks ago and noted up the articles as I went through them. Uh, and I can't, I don't always remember what I've marked up. Okay, oh, here we go. Yes, the brand new H2. You know, remember the um, supercharged H2 from Kawasaki that was uh, released a couple of years ago now? Well, they brought out a new version. In fact, it came out in 2015, I just noticed. My goodness me, doesn't time fly? Um, so they're bringing out a new version for the 2019 model year. It's got 15% more power. If ever a bike needed more power, I'm not sure it was this, but it's now gonna be putting out 228 brake horsepower. Unbelievable amount of power. 
odd with this bike really because um, I've argued before that uh, you know, current sports bikes are kind of wasted on the road, too much power, you can't tap into it. Uh, great if you love doing your track days and then absolutely fill your boots and they look beautiful and they're amazing bits of engineering. So I'm a sports bike fan, I'm just saying you can't use them on the road properly. Well 228 brake horsepower, you certainly can't use that on the road and this isn't really even a, in quotes a proper sports bike um, in that it's, you know, it's quite heavy and big, it's not as agile as the, uh, you know, the top spec other sports bikes from other manufacturers. Um, so interesting to see who this is going to appeal to. Um, personally, um, I think it's ugly. I mean, I think it's been designed in wind tunnels, so I'm sure all these fins and veins and things actually serve a purpose, but I just don't think that's a good looking bike, do you? Um, there's just something about it that, that doesn't appeal to me. It's, I mean, I'd love a go at one just to see what it's like power-wise, but uh, I think it's one for, you know, blatting down the old uh, the test straight or one of those airfield track days or whatever, but uh, as for actually owning one, I don't think it's for me. Anyway, other updates on the thing, not only has it got 15% more power, but it's got um, better brakes. It's got a feeling the brakes have actually been uh, designed specifically for this bike, and it's even got something called self-healing paint, would you believe? So if you scratch the bike over time, the paint sort of flows and fixes itself. How amazing is that? I do like the sound of that, I must admit. Hopefully that sort of thing will filter its way down to all other bikes in the future, but interested to see what you think of the uh, Kawasaki H2, 228 brake horsepower. Do you know anyone that's got the original bike? Have you got one yourself? Um, I don't think I've ever seen one actually on the road. Uh, you know, the existing model, but uh, we'll see what happens with this one once they give it another uh, 28 brake horsepower or whatever the lift is. Incredible. Okay, next story. Now this is one that's been I've been hinting at for ages and it's been floating around for ages. Triumph confirmed the Scrambler 1200. I love Scrambler styles of bikes. If Of all the retro styles, it's Scramblers that for some reason appeal to me. And for some while there's been rumours that Triumph were going to produce a new Scrambler with the 1200cc engine out of the bobber and the Thruxton, albeit maybe a different tune of it. Uh, well, they've now confirmed it because they've been putting some teaser videos out. I don't know if you've seen them on YouTube and on Facebook and stuff, um, saying that the all new Scrambler 1200 is going to break cover Basically, it says here 10 24 2018, so that's uh, the American way of doing dates. So, I guess 24th of October, they're going to make some proper announcement about this. So, it's going to be fascinating to see the detail on this. But um, we've already seen some spy shots from MCN, there's even a little one down here. But, really looking forward to seeing what they've actually got to offer. So, October, the late October, that one comes out. Maybe, I don't know, it won't be the next uh, bike news, but the one after that, maybe we'll be talking about a bit of detail on that. So, can't wait for that. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Do you think that's a good idea? Okay. Third article in here. Oh, <laughs> this is rather fun. Uh, and again, this, and it's just another excuse to show you a picture of the Kawasaki Z900RS. This is the uh, exhaust manufacturer uh, Akropovic, Akropovic, uh, however you want to pronounce it. There's always a load of, um, I personally call it Akropovic. Um, um, and I'm sure somebody will tell me what the actual pronunciation is, but there we go. But what they've got is this test rig where they've basically got a robot to do the testing of their bikes. And the idea is it, uh, can, it allows them to do a repeatable test. It's exactly the same test on every bike with every exhaust that they do, which makes complete sense. It's quite wild that it actually looks a bit humanoid without a head. I guess it sort of has to be because of the design of motorbikes. You've got to have things to attach to the handlebars. You have things to attach to the pegs. So it makes sense that it looks sort of humanoid shape, but uh, just looks a bit spooky. Really just an excuse to show you another picture of the Kawasaki Z900RS. But uh, I thought that was quite wild. Possibly a bit of a gimmick. I don't know on the uh, Acra's part, but I, I like, I love gimmicks. I go for that sort of thing. Okay, next story. Ducati starts the revolution. And there's a picture here of a heavily disguised, uh, looks like a hyper motard um, with one of those squiggly paint jobs. So you can't recognize what it is, but uh, <laughs> we can all see it as a Ducati. Um, and the reason why I mention this is, uh, yeah, this is a hyper motard. Uh, the reason why I mention this is because it's got an underslung exhaust. And the reason that Ducati have done this is because it means that they can hide all the Euro 4, or it might be Euro 5 gubbins now, um, underneath the bike. Uh, and it makes the actual exhaust if it's high level, it, it just makes it easy to manufacture and install, there's more room there. Now, a high level exhaust used to be all the rage about eight or nine years ago, uh, and then there was all the fuss, well, it's not fuss, it's fact, that, uh, you know, weight, high center of gravity, not a good idea, let's get exhaust low. So they all went low again, they went out of favor, but I've always loved the high level exhaust look. I've got the high level exhaust on my old, uh, well, I call it old 2012 Street Triple R, still feels like a new bike to me. Um, and I think they look absolutely fantastic. I think the high level exhaust on the Street Triple in particular look better than the low exhaust on the current Street Triple because the bike was designed that way. So for me personally, I think it's great. Uh, this is uh, one of those unintended offshoots of the Euro regulations that, uh, that mean if exhausts are going to go high again, that's fine with me. I realise it might not be great from a weight distribution point of view, but uh, get on a bit of a tart. I like how bikes look and I think high level exhaust just look great. So Ducati is starting that one off, it seems, with the 2019 um, Hypermotard. Is it Hypermotard? Yeah. Okay, next. 
Okay, so this is another one of these big tests that uh, that uh, MCN do, the 250 mile test again. This time they pitted the Tracer 900 against the Kawasaki Z1000SX. Two bikes, this is the Tracer 900, um, what's it called now? Uh, Tracer 900 GT, that's the one, so it's the one that comes with panniers and slightly longer swing arm, that sort of thing. Pitched it against the uh, Z1000SX, so two touring bikes. The Kawasaki SX being a more classic sports tour, if you like. The Tracer 900 GT being more sort of adventure bike styled. Anyway, they ride them both. I've been lucky enough to ride both these bikes as well, so I've got an opinion on how these compare. And, um, you know, they say they're both great bikes. I would agree with that. And oddly, they both come out with... Um, no, they haven't. I lie. The Z1000 has come out with four out of five stars and the Tracer 900 GT three out of five, uh, which surprised me. Uh, I do like both bikes, but for me, I thought the Tracer 900 GT was just a fantastic bike. To me, it was more comfortable than the Z1000. Um, it uh, went just as fast. Uh, it maybe felt a bit more flimsy. The Z1000, I think, would be better if you're doing long motorway tours. It feels a bit more of a solid bike. But uh, I, I was really impressed by the Tracer 900 GT. Um, Cost-wise, they're basically 20 quid in it, so you take your choice. Um, the Kawasaki to me feels like an older, old school bike. As I said, it's a proper sports tourer. Um, doesn't have quite the electronics and the, and the fancy um, screen TFT, etc. that the Yamaha has. But yet, uh, Michael Neves, who's my um, probably my favorite uh, MCN um, journo, he says that he preferred the S1000SX. Now, he's a, he is a big sports bike fan. It might just be that, so perhaps it tips the balance. But really interesting to see that he, he prefers that over the, over the Tracer. What do you reckon? Have you ridden them both? Anyway, let's see. All right, uh, and then last but not least, just want to point this out. They've got a whole supplement look, quite thick, many pages, 65 hot summer PCP deals. I don't know what it is about PCP. I know that it works for some people. Personally, it doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm old school. I think that, um, you know, if you want something, you save up and you buy it. Um, or at worst case, you get a loan. Um, I think doing these PCP deals where you basically never actually own the bike yourselves and end up having to pay a big payment at the end just to get rid of it and you end up with nothing just isn't quite right. I think it's a way of getting people that can't really afford these bikes roped into them and then they might get stuck. I think this is the next financial problem. Anyway, I'm not blaming MCN for that. What I'm, what I'm saying is, why do MCN always push these so hard? There's obviously some sort of backhander going on there, I don't know, but uh, I know PCP works for somebody, don't flame, for some people, don't flame me for it. I know many people use it. All I'm saying is it's not for me, uh, and it's getting really heavily pushed. If you are a PCP fan, get yourself a copy of this MCN, because there's loads of deals in there if you want to go down that route. Okay, I was going to say last but not least, but of course it's not. It's, uh, how are we doing? Half past 10 now, still no sign of the postman, and the fourth copy of MCN, so I might have to add a bit on the end of this video. But this is the third one. Okay. First story out of this, this is last week's edition, obviously, is this. Uh, fans of Ewan and Charlie will be absolutely thrilled because uh, MCN say that they're going to do a new series. You remember Wrong Way Round or Long Way Round, Long Way Up? Anyway, the Ewan and Charlie series, which I enjoyed as much as The Next Man, which really sort of propelled the BMW GS into the limelight and, uh, you know, arguably has made it the success that it is for BMW. Well, uh, there's talk that there's going to be a new series. I think there might be, this may be built up into a bit of a bigger news story than it really is, because when you read the quote from Charlie Borman, he says, um, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to do it. That's one thing he said. And uh, I'm excited about the thought of getting the old team together again. So it might be more of a wish than a fact, but maybe let's hope it does happen because I'm sure it'll be good. And they're thinking about going, doing the South America, North America thing. So tip of Argentina, right up to the top of Alaska, which would be an amazing ride and it'd be great to see them back again. But how interesting is it that uh, Charlie Borman, of course, is now a Triumph brand ambassador. Uh, and after all that fun and games they had with KTM before uh, that wouldn't give them bikes to do the original series, and maybe, KTM say they're not, but maybe are kicking themselves ever since. Um, what bikes they're gonna do it on? My guess is they're gonna have to do it on Triumph Explorers. That'll be uh, quite something, or rather Triumph Tiger 1200s as they're called now. Or maybe they'll do it on the, I think if you're gonna, if you've gotta go the Triumph range because that's where Charlie's at, I think the Tiger 800 would probably be a better option as it's lighter. Anyway, it's gonna be fascinating to see the new program if and when it comes out, and also fascinating to understand the politics behind the bikes that they end up using, so uh, one to watch out for. On the same page, and whilst we're talking Triumph, Triumph Moto2 set for debut, this is the, um, the um, prototype bike that has in it the new 675cc, uh, not 675, 765, sorry, cc engine out of the street triple, obviously breathed on by uh, Triumph Boffins for use in the Moto2 Championship. Uh, it actually, um, it was shown a while back, a few months back, the engine was run and this bike was shown, but nobody had actually had a ride on it. Well, now they have. It debuted at the British GP, the Grand Prix that was supposed to happen this weekend. Um, Sunday got rained off, don't know if you saw that, uh, which is a real shame. But uh, beforehand, it did get an airing and uh, James Toastland actually um, 
got on the bike and did, did a wet lap on it. First time he's ridden a bike for seven years, so that's another story in itself. But uh, anyway, the bike went out there. It sounded absolutely amazing here. Nothing but good things to say about it. And I have a feeling, actually, one or two um, very lucky um, vloggers have, uh, have ridden this as well now. So, you know, really happy to see that out there. And let's hope that... Um, the interest of the Moto2 really builds up and, and that engine I'm sure will be a success because it's so good in the street triple. Maybe we can convince Triumph to, to bring us back a Daytona with the 765 in it. When I spoke to the, the boffins at uh, Triumph, well not the boffins, actually the marketing guys at Triumph when I was up at the factory a while back and said, why don't you bring us a new Daytona? They basically said, it's just down to demand. They don't believe there is demand for a, uh, a medium-sized sports bike. And they quoted the uh, Yamaha R6 because they watched the sales of that when it was launched. A lovely bike. Um, and the new version was out about two or three years ago. And I can't remember what the figures are. I'm making this up. But it was of the order of the sales of that bike in the year for the R6 was, was less than 100, something like that. So uh, they're saying if you're going to sell less than 100 bikes, we, can't, we just can't afford to put this into production. So that's where they're at with that, which is really interesting. But, uh, you know, I don't know how we show that we're interested and how we would buy it, but if, if enough people want them, they will build a Daytona. So uh, let's go for it, Trump. Let's have that Daytona. Okay, uh, third article in here. BMW buyers get extra cover. This is an amazing story. Well, I think it is, because BMW have decided that from now on, as standard, they're going to offer, instead of a two-year warranty on new BMW bikes, they're going to offer a three-year warranty, um, which is incredible. Not that many bike manufacturers do that. In fact, I think it's only, I think it's Suzuki that do. Yeah, Suzuki currently offer a three-year warranty, but the others, Honda, Ducati, Kawasaki, KTM, Triumph and Yamaha, all two years warranty. Um, really, really interesting. Um, so it shows that BMW have got faith in their products. Sometimes BMW products, modern day ones, they get told that, you know, or I hear people commenting on my videos that BMWs are, oh, they're all very well. You're a GS fanboy. Um, the fact is you're just buying into a brand. They're not actually that, that good. The quality's not there. They break down after the warranty's out. Well, three year warranty now. I think that's um, showing that BMW have got a bit more faith in it. Uh, so great news. And let's hope other bike manufacturers follow um, Three-year warranty, brilliant. So nice one, BMW. Okay, next story in here. Uh, airbags on motorbikes. What do you think about those? Here we have, an, this is a picture of an airbag on a, on a Honda Goldwing because they do come with airbags. What was interesting about this article, um, because I was thinking, you know, airbags within your leathers, that's one thing, and you can get those Dainese ones that, uh, you know, the MotoGP boys wear, for example, uh, which definitely, you know, makes complete sense, but they're very expensive, well over a thousand quid for the, for the airbag system. Uh, and there's all sorts of difficulties with them as well. Um, but actually built onto the motorcycle, what's the point of that? Because of course you're on a bike and you're gonna fly off. Well, this article actually says that 75 to 90% of all serious injuries on motorcycles are caused by frontal collisions so it actually makes sense on the numbers and the stats that uh, if you have an airbag that deploys from the front from the handlebars it's going to help you out so um, very very interesting so it's on the they've got it on the new honda goldwing because there's a lot of real estate on that bike you can fit it the issue is apparently they're quite complicated to actually house on a motorcycle so a small bike you're going to have a bit of trouble but it looks like there's a general move to get airbags on some of the bigger bikes so i'm all for that anything that makes uh, biking uh, safer is, is is good as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's watch out and see which uh, which bike manufacturers bring out airbags um, and whether there's going to be any issues with them forced deployments that sort of thing. But in the in the main, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay, last story on this one, uh, and then I'm going to have to go to a holding pattern waiting for the next edition of MCN to arrive through my letterbox, uh, is this one, Overland Overlords. This is again the, the big MCN group test and they're testing here the uh, the R1200 GS Adventure against the Triumph Explorer. Again, both bikes that I'm very familiar with, both bikes that I've ridden a lot, uh, and I love both bikes. Um, these two both come out with four stars out of five, which is interesting. Um, but MCN agree with me, actually, that the GSA overall is, is the better bike. They're both great bikes, there's no doubt about that, that neither of them can be called bad bikes, but, uh, but they're saying that the, the GS generally does everything well, whereas the, um, the Triumph not necessarily so. In my view, the Triumph uh, 1200 is just a bit too lardy, it's just a bit too heavy for my liking. Uh, if you are going to do any green laning or off-roading, then uh, for a small chap like me, that's going to make things difficult. So interesting and glad to see that on this particular case, um, MCN actually agree with my summary. All right, that's it for the third paper. I'm still waiting with bated breath. It's now uh, ooh, 20 to 11, uh, no sign of poster yet. Uh, I'll give it a couple of hours, and uh, if he turns up, I'll, I'll turn the camera back on and do a review of this week's paper. Otherwise, it's going to have to wait until, uh, until next time. All right, so uh, I'll speak to you in a minute. So it turns out I was doing my postman an absolute disservice because roll forward about half an hour and it turns out my uh, the 
the postman had been, and this was today's MC, and it was sitting on the doormat all along. So uh, anyway, clearly in half an hour, I haven't had a chance to read it in depth, but I have had a quick skim through and just pulled out uh, four uh, stories that caught my eye just to show you. If you want to uh, go into depth, then of course get yourself a subscription to MCN. Uh, great paper, keeps me up to date with everything. Anyway, uh, right, so the first thing I've picked out then from today's MCN is this, if I can find it. Whoops. Here we go. Uh, it's interesting that we're talking about the new um, H2 earlier, the new 228 brake horsepower 2019 model, because down here on this page, on page four, H2 sets new record. And this is somebody who's taken the Ninja H2 to the Bonneville Salt Flats and set a brand new record for a production bike. Uh, the fastest they went was 211.6 miles an hour. Can you imagine doing that on the salt? Um, uh, as ever with these things, you have to do two runs. So they did two runs and the average uh, run over the two was, or the average speed over the two was 209 miles an hour. And that's a new record for a production bike in the P-PB1000 class. Uh, with supercharged engines for a thousand cc so uh, makes me laugh some of these classes they're so particular they might only be in fact how many production bikes are there of a thousand cc with a supercharger hang on a minute isn't that the only one so hang up. i've just gone off that story anyway that was the first one i picked out Alrighty. uh next story that just caught my eye when i was quickly flicking through here or is this at the bottom here? New Sinus is Britain's cheapest adventure bike. Uh, and if you look at the picture of this, this looks absolutely amazing. It says, don't look too closely, and it could be a GS. Well, it certainly looks good. I mean, also, it's got a bit of um, Ducati hypermotard about it. Sadly, it is still only a 125. I say sadly because the cost of this really quite nice looking bike is uh, £2,499. Unbelievable. You could get, what, eight of those for the price of a GSA fully spec or seven or eight uh, so remarkable value for money i've ridden sinus bikes before and i've been pretty impressed with them actually uh, although what i'm not impressed with is given their one two fives they don't go that quick so this one because it's got the panniers and everything else incredible how they can do it for the money um, is something like 40 kilograms heavier than the standard bike now the standard one two five that i rode from sinus was a great little bike um, but i think it topped out around 65 miles an hour if you tucked down and had a bit of a following wind this with the extra 40 kg um mcn is saying will do about 55 at best uh, if there's a bit of a headwind. So uh, you ain't gonna win any races with this thing and uh, you may not wanna go around the world on it, but if you just need to go to work uh, and carry some stuff, it might be the ideal commuter basher. And at two and a half grand, that's probably cheaper than a um, cheaper than a season ticket, isn't it, on the train, depending on where you're going from or two. So uh, yeah, incredible value that. And um, you know, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I'll get a ride on one at some point. All right, next up, um, what have I picked out here? Is it a bike or is it a plane? Now, as you may know, I'm very interested in aircraft, hence the mist and fly my other hobby. I'm a pilot, I like to fly light aircraft. Uh, so this little story caught my, my, my eye. Is it a bike, is it a plane? And this thing here just looks nuts. Basically, uh, this is a plane themed motorcycle. It's got an aircraft engine on it. It's actually a Rolls Royce six cylinder engine out of a Cessna. So although that sounds impressive, um, those Rolls Royce engines in Cessna, it's a nice engine, but they're not, it's not like having an aeroplane engine that lights out of a Spitfire or something. A Rolls Royce Merlin V12 is a whole different kettle of fish to a six cylinder uh, flat uh, engine that you get in a Cessna. Anyway, nonetheless, credit where it's due, this guy here in the US has come up with this wacky looking bike. The thing is, it's got no evidence, MCN say, of any suspension or any brakes. Uh, and you can't imagine the, t the steering circle is much good on it, can you? So uh, apparently it does ride, because there's that guy riding it, but uh, can you imagine what that would be like to ride? I love the looks of it, but uh, yeah, how absolutely nuts is that? But uh, hats off to that guy, I say. I love nuts people, and I love nuts bikes, so good one. Uh, but I don't suppose it's gonna go into production and sell too many. Okay, and then the last story for this week before I get into some uh, parish notices of news about the channel, uh, is this one here. Um, oh yes, this is another of these 250 mile tests that, um, that MCN do, which I quite like. And this time they've pitted the Ducati Supersport up against the MV Augusta v uh, Gra uh, Turismo Veloce 800, uh, which I think looks absolutely beautiful. I've not ridden the MV or indeed any MV Augusta before. I have ridden the Ducati Supersport. I was a little bit underwhelmed by it actually as a Ducati fan. I don't really like the looks of it very much. And uh, and it wasn't um, it wasn't anywhere near as exciting as my Panigale, for example. Nice bike, but nothing just didn't float my boat. Whereas the MV looks absolutely amazing. Um, I think it's one of their best looking bikes. If you look at it from the other side with the triple exhaust on, it looks absolutely amazing. However, the MCN verdict was quite interesting because they think the uh, Ducati is four out of five and the MV three out of five. They say that the MV 
Turismo Veloci 800 is actually the best bike that they make, yet it still only manages three out of five. So it's a bit of a shame that the, these bikes never get great reviews, the MVs, um, but they always look absolutely amazing. They're saying it's great once it gets going and you give it some the welly, it's great at high speeds, but lower down, um, it's a bit clunky. I think it's saying things like the um, clutch and the gearbox uh, are quite difficult to live with. I think that's what it said. Um, anyway, so a shame, looks lovely. Out of the two, I'd definitely have the MV just on looks alone, but uh, if it rides bad, then uh, maybe not. But there we go, another interesting review from MCN. Anyway, needless to say, I haven't written the whole paper, uh, written, haven't read the whole paper in depth yet. Looking forward to doing that this afternoon. I shall stick my feet up and do that. Um, if you want to get yourself up to date on all the current news, this one's in the shops now. This is sounding more like an advert. I guarantee you MCN do not pay me to advertise their paper, okay? Right, uh, so that was that. I said I'd give you a couple of parish notices, just some stuff uh, to do with the channel, just to let you know what's coming up. First of all, must say thanks to Custom Fit Guards. They sponsor this video. Uh, they're the guys that make the earplugs that you see on my tour videos. Um, and while I'm mentioning tour videos, uh, thank you very much for all the kind comments that I've had for the Arctic um, tour videos that I'm currently publishing. They go up on a Friday. Uh, I don't know if you've spotted it, but uh, I try to do it. When I do these tours, I always put the tour videos up on a Friday, like a bit like Cracker Jack. It's a Friday afternoon treat. Um, and we currently, I just posted episode three last Friday of the Arctic tour, uh, episode four, of course, coming this Friday. And I've finished editing the whole series now. In total, there are 12. Now, that sounds like a lot. They're about half an hour each. Um, but I, and maybe I would say this, wouldn't I? But I, I do believe it's true. The later episodes are the better ones. The scenery in Norway, as I come back from the Arctic Circle, I did make it to the Arctic Circle. Um, little spoiler there. Uh, when you come back and you go down the West Coast, the scenery just gets better and better, and it wasn't too shabby going up there. So uh, if you're at all interested in Norway, touring, Arctic Circle, do check out those videos. Uh, I really enjoyed filming them, and uh, I'm really quite pleased with how the series has turned out. So thank you for those that have watched them so far. Do please keep watching. Uh, and then other things I've got coming up, of course, I've got all the usual stuff coming up. I'll be doing... Um, uh, more reviews of kit, more reviews of bikes. So in particular, I've got the uh, Suzuki GSX-R 1000R, which is the um, flagship sports bike, if you like, for Suzuki. I rode the standard GSX-R 1000 um, about six months ago. Uh, now I've tried the GSX-R 1000R, a bit of a tongue twister, um, and I had that on long-term review. So I've got a few videos of that coming up, other, other um, bikes as well. I've got uh, Actually, reviews, a couple of reviews of items that I've been asked for a lot. One is the bag that I took on the Arctic Tour. There's a, a Go Gravel roll bag that you see me use instead of panniers. Worked an absolute treat, and, I, and I'm now no longer using, I don't think I'll ever use my BMW panniers again, because um, the bag just worked a treat. So I've got a review coming up on that soon. I'm also going to be doing a review on the jacket and trousers that you saw me wearing on there. It's a, it's a new jacket and trousers. I can't say too much about it at this point, uh, other than they're from Oxford Products. I'll be doing a video of those going up on the 17th of September. Um, it's not actually quite available in the shops yet, that's why I can't talk more about that. But I will be doing a review, as I say, on the 17th on that, giving you all the details. They worked a real treat as well. Uh, and lots more besides. Do make a note as well next live stream I love doing those things um, they don't get that many views I don't know what well, well they do okay but I love the interaction that we have uh, so if you are inclined to join me for a live stream the next one I'm doing is Wednesday September the 19th at 8 p.m. so two weeks time on the Wednesday 8 o'clock UK time I'll be doing technology permitting I'll be doing my next live stream and I've got some uh, exciting news to tell you as well about something else that I'm getting involved in so uh, I think I should be able to tell you about that then so that's Wednesday September 19th 8 p.m. do join me it'd be great to have you there live um, uh, oh quick update on the drone situation if you have been watching the Arctic um, uh, series you know that my drone packed up on me I couldn't take any drone shots bar some very minimal ones which you will see in the later episodes but uh, Real pain in the backside. I'm getting towards a fix now. I had to send the drone back to uh, DJI. Uh, they have got a service centre in Holland. Uh, they've had a look at it, reset it. Uh, turns out it looks like it might be the connector lead from my phone to the controller that was the problem all along. I've just ordered a new connector lead. Uh, it did, came to actually turn up today with that copy of MCN, so I haven't tried it yet, but I'm hoping that's going to be the fix. So hopefully we'll get some more drone stuff soon. Um, and uh, that's about it. I've made one more note here, but I can't, uh, I can't actually read it. Oh, one other thing that's happening as well. I mentioned a while back, lots of people asked me, when am I going to do some reviews of older bikes? And, uh, and I mentioned that I've had this idea for doing a series called Reader's Rides, uh, where I get one of you guys to either bring your bike here or I go to yours and we talk about your bike and just be nosy about your bike. Well, I'm really pleased to say, fingers crossed, uh, at the moment, it looks like tomorrow I'm going to be recording the first one of those. Not too sure how long it's going to take to get live, but uh, do stay tuned for Reader's Rides coming soon. And, uh, and also on that video, I'll be talking about how you can get involved in that as well. So uh, so that's all coming up on the Missenden Flyer. Thanks for your support as ever. Uh, I really enjoy doing this stuff. I particularly like doing the bike news. I love doing the live stuff. 
and of course the trips and tours. Any other ideas you've got for what you'd like to see on the channel, let me know. I do obviously change the content according to uh, what you tell me you want to see. All right, that's it for now. Look forward to speaking to you next time. Till then, this has been the Mr. Fly. Cheerio.